Okay, what a great turnout. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the EOL seminar series. It is my great pleasure to welcome one of our own, Dr. Scott Spuler, who is a research engineer at EOL's remote sensing facility. Scott received his master's and PhD in applied optics and engineering systems from the Colorado School of Mines. Dr. Spuler currently specializes in developing innovative optical and laser-based instruments to enhance atmospheric understanding. He holds a dozen patents and counting. Notable contributions include designing a rapid scanning eye-safe LIDAR system with practical applications in U.S. national homeland security. And he served as the principal investigator for creating a laser-based instrument for measuring wind velocities ahead of aircraft. This innovative instrument played a pivotal role in calibrating aircraft sensors and lending unprecedented accuracy in airspeed, pressure, and temperature measurements. Currently, Scott leads the development of a cost-effective laser remote sensor for profiling atmospheric water vapor, clouds, aerosols, and temperature, which is what he's going to speak, talk about in his presentation today. This instrument advancement is pivotal for national weather observation networks, providing significant benefits in severe weather forecasting and precipitation forecast improvement. So for those who are participating virtually, please be welcomed and you can ask your questions on the Slido screen at the bottom of the presentation and we're gonna archive those questions and then have a Q&A session at the end of the speaker's presentation. Dr. Scott Spuler, welcome and the podium is yours. Okay, can you hear me all right? All right, thank you, Jackie. Um, so I'm gonna start off by apologizing. Uh, my title here actually didn't have anything about what I was profiling, so if you're here to learn about the UTLS, I'm sorry, this instrument is not the right one. Uh, we're gonna be profiling the, the lower troposphere, and it is an instrument talk. It is going to be fairly high level. It's going to be more of the story of why we made the design choices that we did make. Um, that's kind of the area that I really like to, to focus on. And uh, if you don't know a whole lot about uh, LiDAR or laser remote sensing, I hope you come away with learning at least a little bit about some of the basics uh, on why we make the choices we do. Um, so before I begin, there's a whole lot of collaborators for this particular project. Um, we have three university collaborators and there's a whole host of people within NSM, uh, NSF NCAR who contributed to this project. I, especially for what I'm gonna talk about today, wanna to call out uh, Matt Heyman and Robert Stilwell for their contribution and I'm gonna be showing some of their work and also Kevin Rapaski from uh, Montana State University. All right, so to begin, just a reminder, uh, spectroscopy is how light interacts with matter. This is a really exciting thing. This is the light bulb right outside of my office. Uh, so you start with something really exciting. Um, I am taking the picture of it, though, after looking at it with a diffraction grating. So we've separated the colors out in one dimension. And what this is called is a slitless spectrograph. You can see the light bulb uh, repeating itself uh, as a function of wavelength. Um, and if you really wanted to know a little bit more about this, the, what's going on in the spectrum in the wavelength space, you would take that light, you would focus it down on a slit. This is what's typically done. And that's uh, an image of a compact fluorescent light bulb below it there. And if you look at the line that's way on the left-hand side here, this violet line, that is a mercury emission line. These other lines that are located here, they are re-emission of the light that was emitted by the mercury line, and that's what makes it look more or less like white light to us, but still there's quite a lot of structure there. The mercury emission line is actually, um, there are several over here in the UV. You can't see them uh, because of the sensor, and also it's not making it outside of the glass. But if you didn't know what was inside uh, the light, you could identify it using emission spectroscopy. This is kind of a fun fact if you didn't know. This is how we discovered helium. Uh, it was discovered using a sun spectrograph in 1868. Uh, helios is the Greek word for sun. And we actually didn't know that helium existed on Earth till over a decade later. So let's just turn back to mercury. Uh, that was actually my graduate work. I was measuring mercury in, in the atmosphere, uh, developing a sensor to do that. Instead of using emission spectroscopy, I used uh, 
absorption spectroscopy, which is a much more sensitive way to actually measure a concentration of the species. If you didn't know, mercury in the atmosphere is a toxin. It comes from a large municipal solid waste incinerators from coal-fired power plants. It also comes from crematoria, from people's dental fillings. Uh, if you have silver fillings, they're half mercury. And that actually uh, is a non-negligible amount of emissions. It's a little over 5% of what comes into the atmosphere. Um, on that uh, somber note, uh, there, my goal was to develop a laser-based instrument that could detect these trace amounts of mercury as a way to benefit people. Um, now, if you're going to do laser absorption spectroscopy, especially if you're going to do it in, in a very careful way, it requires lasers that are narrow band. They're spectrally pure, what we would call a single frequency. Also something that has agility, it's tunable, and it's got to overlap with the species of interest. Now, this is the instrument that I developed, and if you bear with me, I promise there's a point. I'm going to belabor uh, some of the details here. It starts with a flash lamp pumped neodymium YAG. This is a very powerful laser. Uh, it operates in the near infrared, and you use a couple crystals to, to get it to uh, get to the UV at 355. Now, this is neither narrow band nor tunable at this point, and if you ran it continuously, you'd have to change the flash lamps about once a month. Then there was a dye laser that I used that the, the ND YAG pumped, and there was a Coumarin 500 dye that I used. This had really low photo stability. Uh, it would degrade much faster than the flash lamps, and I had to change the dye quite often in that as well. But now I've got tunable 507 nanometer light. I have to double that yet again and use an auto tracker needed in, in order to keep it uh, pointed where I want to, but then I could use this technique called cavity ring down spectroscopy and make very uh, detailed measurements of mercury in the atmosphere. So this is just one of the scans from uh, that work and it's showing 13 part per trillion. The instrument could uh, measure down to sub PPT and so that's much higher than what's uh, in this room you would expect that there would be at least a few part per trillion. So it was able to go down below background levels. And that's really exciting, but this instrument was never leaving the laboratory. It was too complex, it was too expensive, it required way too much maintenance. So my overall goal as a young uh, person trying to learn how to create instrumentation is the idea of trying to benefit society. This was not the instrument. Following that, I went to uh, the telecommunications. This is more or less where I did my postdoc. Uh, at the time, telecommunications was really a booming industry. It was the first time I was introduced to semiconductor lasers, uh, at least uh, in detail. So what I did there was uh, what's called dense wavelength division multiplexing, and it's taking a whole lot of different lasers at different frequencies, and I was responsible for designing diffraction gratings, much like I used to take the picture of the light bulb outside my office, take all that light, stick it onto a single fiber, you could send it across the world, and then you do the same thing on the other side. And each one of those light sources is modulated and cont contains information, and that information is then carried uh, onto the other side. And so it was a way to compress information as a function of wavelength. So uh, an interesting point from this is I didn't pay attention to the lasers at all in, when I was there. They just worked. Uh, and so that was a really interesting contrast to my graduate work where all of the work was involved in trying to get the laser to be at the right wavelength and the right uh, the right uh, tunability. So there are a few design principles that I learned before coming here. Uh, the first is that successful instrumentation often requires making more than hero measurements. If the instrument's too complex or it's too expensive, too difficult to maintain, it's likely going to have very limited use in society. Uh, this next one is the thing that I think a lot I really like working in this space, and it's one si it's one thing to understand the theory, but it's another thing altogether to make those theories work in the real world, subject to equipment limitations. Making instrumentation is hard. Uh, and then finally, I learned that semiconductors are really useful tools. They had enabled this whole field of telecommunications. Uh, which uh, changed the world, and it was really due to their simplicity of use, their small size, their high reliability, and long lifespan. So with that in mind, let's turn to uh, the problem that is the focus of this talk. Uh, these four overview publications on the top uh, really dive into the details, but in summary, the atmospheric science community has been advocating for a very long time that we address a well-known observational gap in the lower troposphere. And what is needed is continuous, 
high vertical resolution thermodynamic measurements, and not just at one location, at a spacing of about 150 to about 200 kilometers. And so if you were gonna cover the United States with that, you're talking several hundred locations to do that. Um, now, again, captured in, in these articles here is this surface-based national scale network would significantly improve our ability to predict mesoscale severe weather events. So how are we measuring uh, these thermodynamic properties currently? This room knows uh, probably some of you much better than me. Uh, we obviously release radio songs twice a day at about 80 locations that provides very high uh, vertical uh, uh, state parameters of temperature, pressure, also winds, water vapor. And in addition, there is water vapor uh, that comes from aircraft. So we get profiles from uh, at airports. You also get the temperature and pressure from those aircraft as well. So those are high resolution, but they are not continuous. Uh, satellites also provide information globally, um, but in the lower troposphere, those measurements tend to be rather coarse in uh, horizontally and vertically. Um, there are two ground-based instruments that provide continuous water vapor and temperature, uh, two radiometers, both microwave and infrared. We'll talk a little bit more about those later. Uh, they tend to get pretty coarse as you go up in range, and they also tend to uh, have solutions that are closer to the climatological mean. Uh, the GPS receivers will provide continuous measurements, but that is a column only. And then finally, we've got Raman liner, which do provide the high vertical resolution water vapor and temperature measurements that are needed. And um, the question is, how well does that technology scale to something that would be needed at the scales we're talking about for a ground-based network? Uh, just to start talking about that, this is just a simplified design space of active remote sensing, laser remote uh, sensing. Uh, there's kind of two categories that have existed for a long period of time. Raman LiDARs exist in this green circle here. They are high cost, high performance LiDAR profilers. On the other hand, there are these low cost, low performance LiDAR profilers like salometers. And I think we can envision that, that yeah, we could get several hundred of those across the United States. Um, but they don't measure temperature, they don't measure water vapor, they give relative information about aerosol backscatter. So we're really needing to create in the space between a, a whole new class of LiDAR profiling. And to maybe convince you a little bit more about some of the limitations of why we don't just put LiDAR, or Raman LiDAR everywhere, I'll dig into just a little bit uh, of that. Uh, so Raman LiDAR uses a different type of spectroscopy. It's not emission, it's not absorption. What happens is when the uh, photon comes in, you actually get information content uh, that's scattered off and that's actually really a, a cool uh, type of spectroscopy because, and it's shown in this diagram here, if we just have that 355 neodymium YAG laser that I had back in grad school, and you send that out, you get all this information content when you look at the Rayleigh scatter. So you get information about oxygen and nitrogen and water vapor, all with a system that doesn't need to be uh, tuned at all. But there's two downsides to this. First of all, the Rayleigh scatter. So this is the signal that would come from molecules. You can see how far down these signals are, several orders of magnitude down. They are very weak. Uh, the second thing is the information content is spread out in space. If you wanted to gather, say, all of the Q branch here for water vapor, you would need to open up your bandwidth a little bit. So you end up with uh, Raman liners being forced into this position where you are gonna have to use a high energy laser source. Uh, those tend to be expensive and they also are not eye safe. Uh, now, in Raman liner, it's in principle known that the concentration of nitrogen here that you would get would allow you to, to uh, calibrate or use as a reference signal to measure the amount of water vapor. But in practice, what's done for Raman liners is that they are, the water vapor is calibrated off of radio sons. And so that would increase your operational cost. Um, and so, what we're going to do is try to look at a technique that could be using this uh, elastic scatter. In this uh, plot here, it's uh, the Rayleigh scatter. 
But what would happen if we tried to like turn down the laser uh, and actually do low power or say a, a micropulse Raman lighter? This uh, publication just came out very recently by Paolo uh, Girolamo in 2023, and he's showing 12 days of uh, measuring water vapor with a low power Raman lighter. Uh, I'll just say up front that this is still 100 times more power than we can get from semiconductor lasers. It's not eye safe and it still is going to need to be calibrated from radio sons. But we can see the daytime performance from this instrument is the, the data availability is generally less than a kilometer during this time. Uh, sorry, during the daytime. And this is actually in November, so it gets a lot worse as you move into summer. Um, but this slide again shows why is because these signals are so far down. As you turn the laser down, if you can't somehow decrease your bandwidth, you're going to just end up with a very poor signal to noise, and that, that is the case here. So we're going to look at something, uh, a different approach. We're going to do a semiconductor-based LiDAR architecture. What are the pros for that? Well, I mentioned that they're low cost, they're low maintenance, uh, they have long life, they're stable. They have, they've enabled a, a lot of uh, progress elsewhere in society. They're also really easy to make the iSafe uh, classification. Um, maybe that's a really nice way to say that they're low power, which is a one of the, the, the difficulties with them. And even with the latest innovation, which we'll talk about later, they're still going to be 100 times less than solid state lasers. So we're going to have to use some engineering solutions to get these to work. Uh, we're going to utilize that more efficient uh, elastic scatter versus doing Raman scatter. Uh, we're going to use very narrow bandwidth sources. And then in our receiver, we're going to do both spectral filtering, and then we're going to spatially limit what the detector can see by narrowing the field of view. So before getting into the details of how the measurement's made, I'm just going to orient you to where we are in the electromagnetic spectrum. The instrument operates around 800 nanometers wavelength. That's where these devices exist, the amplifiers, the sources exist, and also where there's suitable overlap between species in the atmosphere. Uh, if we zoom really close into this region, there are two areas I'm going to talk about today. One, there's just some oxygen absorption features here, and now there's some water vapor here on the right-hand side. Let's just look at the water vapor side. What I'm plotting is just a couple of uh, water vapor lines here. It's absorption cross-section as a function of wavelength for a short region here, and I'm showing what it looks like if you were to measure that on the surface at one kilometer intervals up to five kilometers. So they do change with the temperature and pressure for a US standard atmosphere. So the technique we're gonna use is called differential absorption LIDAR or dial. And the idea is you send two different frequencies, very narrow band at the location where these arrows are. Uh, one is tuned to the water vapor line where you've got some absorption. The other one is used as a reference. So it sees all of the attenuation that's happening in the atmosphere just like the other one. And the only difference because they're very closely spaced is the water vapor. And so by looking at the elastic scatter that comes back as we photon count this, we're able to make a direct measurement of the number density of water vapor from this uh, measurement technique. So a few interesting uh, things about dial. So we're measuring a difference in transmission between the uh, absorbing and non-absorbing wavelengths. We are using elastic scatter as a distributed backscatter reflector. So that's, uh, that allows for a significantly lower power than Raman lighter systems. And that lower power requirement is what enables us to be able to use the low maintenance, low cost, ice safe semiconductor lasers. Uh, dial, narrow band dial, is self-calibrating. Uh, so there are no radio sons that are needed. It does require a stable single frequency laser source, uh, and that needs to correspond with the species that we're interested in the atmosphere. It does require rough estimates of temperature and pressure, and we get those from surface sensors. So what I'm going to show you is uh, the first field campaign for what at the time was called WV dial, which is really just the technique name. Uh, so it wasn't a very good instrument name. We later changed it to uh, Micropulse Dial, or MPD for short. Um, but this is two uh, months of continuous operation at its first field campaign. So on the top, I'm showing you just a curtain plot from 0 to 12 kilometers. This is basically what you would see from a salometer. Um, and so you can see the clouds. You can see the aerosol features. The interesting part is that there is water vapor finally. We've got continuous water vapor on the bottom. 
And that was what is new. If we just zoom in to a, a much more detailed section, this comes from the second field project from this instrument. Now we're just looking at 12 hours. And uh, operationally, what you would get is a radio sound at 0 UTC and 12 UTC. In this case, because it was a field project, we have 11 radio sounds that are happening. And you can see the detail that you would miss if you didn't have the continuous measurements. We've got these lofted uh, water vapor features that are happening during this time. And if you go down at each one of these radio sounds, the, the dial is showing inf its information in red and the radio sounds are in blue. And you see we're getting really nice agreement uh, and seeing the evolution of these lofted water vapor layers uh, for this project. This is the exact same data I just showed you, but now extended out a little bit in range on the top here, and now it's 24 hours in time. This comes from Weckworth et al., the 2016 paper, and I'm showing you uh, the co-located measurements that come from two radiometers. This is an infrared radiometer, and this is a microwave radiometer. Uh, in this middle region where the dial is showing these lofted regions of water vapor, they are not uh, showing up in either, in either of the radiometers. That could be for two reasons. One, the resolution gets relatively coarse. The other one is there are multiple solutions that you can get from a radiometer. It's what's called an ill-posed problem when you're trying to do the retrieval. And so to constrain that, you look at a lot of the priors. You look at a history, so really a climatological mean. And so if this is rare, and uh, having looked at a lot of water vapor, these conditions are quite rare, these instruments are going to be forced into solutions that don't see that. And so you can imagine if this is a precursor to severe weather, and I'm not saying that it is, um, that these instruments might not be the right ones to use to see that. So this quote comes from the paper. Uh, it says that the continuous unattended operations and high quality water vapor profiles from the dial make it a uh, appealing candidate to function as part of a potential nationwide network of thermodynamic profiling instruments. That's a mouthful. Um, I will say that these two instruments are measuring water vapor and temperature. This instrument is just measuring water vapor at the time. So that got us thinking, is there a way to try to measure temperature with a very similar system? Can we use dial? Can we use that elastic scatter? Can we stay with the same uh, semiconductor LiDAR architecture and work towards temperature? So we went back and we started looking at what the community had done, uh, the LiDAR community in the mid-90s. And it seemed, uh, maybe it's reasonable, it said temperature retrievals uh, with an accuracy of better than one Kelvin in the entire uh, troposphere are feasible if the error that results from Rayleigh Doppler correction can be avoided. So this is Jens Busenberg. He was leading the research. And he's looking at using temperature sensitive oxygen lines. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But he seems fairly optimistic if we can avoid this issue. Well, then he's writing a book chapter about seven years later. And it's much less optimistic. I'll just skip to the end part. But again, he's talking about this Doppler broad and Rayleigh scatter and that there's no further attempts to use the dial technique for temperature that have been reported. So it didn't look very promising to use oxygen dial. Um, what he was getting was an uncertainty of more than 10 Kelvin, even more than that at strong gradients. And in order to improve numerical weather prediction, there was a threshold of we were going to need to get to 3 Kelvin. So we thought that perhaps well, first of all, let's talk about what the, the Rayleigh Doppler scattering is. It, when you're at these wavelengths in the atmosphere, there's what's known as a two-component atmosphere. There are very, two very different scattering targets. Aerosols, when you send out narrow band light, they preserve that, that narrow frequency, and it comes back narrow. Uh, molecules are very small. We tend to think uh, that, well, maybe they're so small we're not even going to get much signal from them, but there are 29 billion billion of them per cubic centimeter, there's a lot of them. And because of their really small mass, they're moving around at 300 meters per second. So we get Doppler broadening from that. And so we end up with this two uh, component atmosphere where light from aerosols comes back with one frequency component and the light from molecules comes back broadened. Now this is especially a problem if you're trying to do spectroscopy on something narrow uh, when we're talking about uh, which oxygen lines are. So this is the problem and at the same time we were working with a instrument that that's exactly what it measured was which is a high spectral resolution LIDAR. 
And so the whole goal of the, of the high spectral resolution LIDAR was to use the molecules to separate them out and use them as a target because they're in the Rayleigh regime and we understand that really well. And it separates out the me, which is in, sorry, the, the aerosols, which is in the me regime. So the way it works is we've got this uh, two component atmosphere that's coming in and we measure that on a detector so we have some signal. We are now doing absorption spectroscopy in the receiver. We tune the laser to operate at something that has very strong absorption. Uh, iodine or potassium or rubidium are all, have all been used. And what you get on the other side of that is all of the aerosol features have been notched out. So this provides, this information provides this molecular to aerosol ratio. And this was the piece that Busenberg was saying we didn't have. And so we thought, well, because we've got uh, this architecture that seems pretty flexible with these lasers, let's try to put the two together. If we can do that, maybe we could work towards temperature. Um, and so that's what we did in 2017. We built a prototype that had water vapor and HSRL. And I think it's interesting just to talk about what uh, the HSRL gives you all by itself in, in providing calibrated aerosols. So this plot uh, shows a couple different regions that I'd like to highlight. It's 24. Uh, hours and looking at 12 kilometers. If you look at this region on the top, this is just what you would get from an elastic backscatter LIDAR. Uh, and you can see there's a fair amount of signal that's coming from the middle of the cloud. That's a little odd, but what's happening is we're getting a lot of extinction and this LIDAR is not able to disambiguate the two. When we go to the HSRL technique, it's able to create a much nicer picture, a much more realistic picture of what's happening in that cloud. If we look at the middle here, you can see that there's some aerosol returns somewhere there. They're a little bit diluted. Again, if we look at the HSRL technique, that aerosol content is really brought out, much stronger. And then finally, there's this region for LIDAR and for radar as well. As you get really close, what happens is the light tends to be very inefficiently collected. Uh, we call this the geometric overlap function. Um, and you can make some adjustments, uh, some assumptions to an elastic scatter LiDAR and try to get that back, but you don't need to do that with an HSRL and you're able to resolve this boundary layer structure much nicer for an HSRL. So now that we've put these two together, we have a water vapor dial and an aerosol content, we thought we would go back and try to look at, can we now get back the temperature content that Busenberg first had proposed back in the mid 90s. So I had mentioned that we were doing dial on water vapor. We've got these two wavelengths. Once we know the water vapor content, we are now picking lines in the oxygen where we, in principle, know the concentration. So we're not trying to measure the concentration. We're trying to measure very temperature sensitive lines and back out the temperature from that. Uh, this was Robert Stilwell's idea. Instead of actually having to have five wavelengths, we're doing this thing where the offline in the oxygen is tuned to a potassium line. So we're able to, in the same instrument, do HSRL and oxygen dial uh, at the same time. So what we are doing in principle is we have three instruments in one. We have a water vapor dial, we have an HSRL, and we have an oxygen dial. There are a lot of interdependencies between these three measurements. I've already talked about that the backscatter ratio, this amount of molecules to the amount of uh, aerosols is really important to correct the temperature. But temperature actually feeds back into water vapor and it feeds back into backscatter as well. Um, but there's a couple really nice things about each one of these. Dial and HSRL just use a minimum set of assumptions. Uh, they use a minimal set of external data, just temperature and pressure. So they're both self-calibrating techniques. And so what that does is it allows us to provide independent uh, thermodynamic state variables uh, that can be used for verification, validation, and uh, data assimilation. Okay, uh, the first time that this prototype was used in 2019, it was part of another project uh, where we had built a five unit network and we parked it next to a Raman uh, lighter as well out in Oklahoma. And what I'm showing you is just the water vapor for now. The idea is we added all these other pieces. Did we screw up the water vapor? And uh, so I'm looking at, I think this is about 12 days worth of data. So you can see the, the Raman lighter on the top. And then these are radiosons that are being launched. There were 77 radiosons were released during this time. 
The MPD is below it. We're seeing, we're seeing very similar features as well. It's important to note that this Raman lighter has 500 times the power aperture that the MPD has. And they're seeing uh, about to the same range. We can look at the MPD against radiosons and see we've got very good correlation between the two doing a scatter plot histogram. We can look at the Raman lighter versus radiosons, which it was calibrated against those radiosons, so it should agree quite well with those. And then we can look at the MPD versus the the Raman lighter itself, and again, we see very good agreement between all of these. So that's the water vapor, and we got our first glimpse at temperature from this project. This comes from Stillwell et al. Uh, 2020 paper. The Raman lighter temperature is shown on the top here. We just have 60 hours. On the bottom is the dial temperature, and about 69% of this data fell within the region we were looking for, this 3 Kelvin uh, accuracy that is needed to improve numerical weather prediction. So it was a really good proof of concept. It gave us uh, some confidence that we were headed in the right direction, but the technology readiness wasn't there. We're certainly going to need to make something that can run for more than 60 hours. We also found that there was a fair amount of errors uh, in the temperature retrieval that needed to be corrected in the spectroscopy. And we now have moved to where we were the first ones. There was no one else in the community who was doing this, so all the tools from this point on we're having to develop ourselves, and, and that's quite difficult to do. I will say uh, just a little bit about the LiDAR architecture that we went back to make the instrument more uh, robust. I won't go into too many details here. What we use uh, is called a MOPA configuration that stands for Master Oscillator Power Amplifier. It doesn't really matter. Uh, too much other than to say we're using two very narrow seed frequencies uh, for online and offline. Those are CW. We pulse them with semiconductor optical amplifiers, so now these are interleaved in time. And this works as a, as a multifunction uh, amplifier and switch. When it's off, it's very good at absorbing the light, so we get very good isolation between these two frequencies in time. And then finally, the power amplifier comes from what's called the tapered semiconductor optical amplifier. It's just like those SOAs, the semiconductor optical amplifiers. It's a, it's a waveguide, but then it tapers in one direction. And what that allows us to do is really up the power. So this is a really key part. Uh, we're able to get about 10 watts of peak power out of these devices. Um, we then send it through uh, the receiver, uh, the transmit receive path. I mentioned already what we'll do is we'll try to take the field of view spatially and just let the, the detector see just a very little bit of the sky. In the receiver, we have a two-stage spectral filter uh, using etalons and thin film filters, uh, and that just gives us a bandwidth of a few tens of picometers. And then we do photon counting on the back end of that. If I add all the parts in for temperature, we added a lot of parts, but you can see there's a nice symmetry to that. There's a, real, there's a nice mirroring of that, and so we aren't developing a new technique. We're just adding uh, the same components, and we've added two more wavelengths. Uh, in the receiver, we are doing an extra channel here in order to do the high spectral resolution LiDAR. Um, okay, so some results from that. So now, just this past summer, we went to M squared Hats, and it was the first time that we had this new instrument for a science field campaign. And I'm showing about a week's worth of data with three different data products. And I picked a different color map for each one of them just to keep them clear. Uh, there's the water vapor on the top. This is the HSRL, which you can either do backscatter ratio or backscatter coefficient. And on the bottom now, we've got continuous uh, temperature profiling. There were 123 radiosons that were released for this project. And I'm going to show you how that compares for the entire project in the next two slides. So this is water vapor. We've got continuous uh, water vapor for two and a half months on the top here. Uh, if we look at the mean error, there's relatively no mean error. And we're getting a root mean squared error of uh, about a half a gram per cubic meter up to the 50% data availability range of three and a half kilometers. Now, I just want to remind you again what the Raman liner was seeing during daytime uh, when we turned down the power. And so this is all daytime because all these uh, songs, except for one, were released during the day. Uh, if we look at uh, a scatter plot again, you can see there's really good correlation between the radiosons and the water vapor. If we switch over to temperature, now we have continuous temperature for the entire project. If I look at the mean error, there is about a 2 Kelvin bias down low. That mean error goes away as we go up in range. 
The RMSE starts at about two Kelvin and it makes its way to about three and a half Kelvin up to the 50% data availability range, daytime of three kilometers. Um, so we're just getting to this uh, area where we're reaching the three Kelvin requirement for improving uh, numerical weather prediction. And if we look at the radio sons versus the uh, MPD for temperature, again, we're seeing really high correlation between these two measurement techniques. Uh, just a brief uh, overview of sort of the timeline. So we had a pretty mature product for absolute humidity back in 2015. Uh, we had aerosol backscatter that we added to that through the HSRL technique in 2017. We have a five unit network that was built in 2019 where our prototype temperature went in that, but then we've upgraded that so that all the five systems have the ability to measure temperature in the, in the units right now. So having them side by side, we're really focusing on looking at the source of that bias and it's a powerful tool to be able to use these instruments as referees against each other to help us speed up uh, our research in this field. I want to end with a couple uh, slides about where we're going with advanced processing uh, for temperature in, in uh, specifically. So this comes from Matt Heyman's recent paper that is in review right now. And what I'm showing on the top is this is a new advanced uh, temperature processing that uses a global method. I mentioned all those interdependencies. So in the new code, that's taking those into consideration uh, as you're uh, retrieving the temperature. And you're also doing a, a, a denoising using a Poisson total variation, a denoising technique. So this is the new data. Uh, this is what I had been showing you, the, t the temperature profiling for just three days that came from this most recent uh, M squared hats project. There were radiosons that were re released at 10 and 3 each day. Uh, so you can see those three days. And here's the one nighttime son. So there are seven sons that released during this time period. If you look at the radio son, you can see this is a little bit small, but the radio son temperature is in gray. The standard method is here in orange. And uh, the new uh, processing here is shown in blue. Obviously, the, the new processing is reaching much further. But it's also able to track this very small inversion that's showing up uh, in temperature throughout this time period, much better than the standard processing, partially because it can see further in range, but also because it has much less noise. Uh, if we look at the entire M squared hats uh, project now, and we look at those two different temperature techniques, uh, processing techniques, here's the original processing technique. Let's, if we look at the 50% data availability range for daytime, uh, this is being processed now at 40 minutes. I was processing a little longer before, but it's seeing to two and a half kilometers. This can be pushed up to maybe three kilometers if you were to average it longer. But with the exact same processing time of 40 minutes, the new method uh, that Matt has developed here is able to see up to five kilometers. If we look at, at, just look at the shaded regions of this plot here. So this is how they compare to the radiosons. Again, we're at 40 minutes being able to see about what is needed to improve numerical weather prediction, about three Kelvin uncertainty in the standard processing. But in the new processing, we've now pushed that down to below two Kelvin, and there's uh, and that extends much further in range up to uh, five kilometer range. One last thing to point out is this uh, solid line is showing you that what's limiting this method is the instrument. There's a bias down low, and the noise is actually around the one Kelvin level. So we're really focused going forward now on improving the instrument uh, as we pass back and forth between improving the the algorithm and, and improving the instrument. So in summary, I'll just say that the progress in developing a cost-effective thermodynamic profiler, we've made a lot of progress in the last 12 years. Uh, we're using a semiconductor-based LiDAR approach. Uh, it is range-resolved continuous thermodynamic profiles that use a minimum set of uh, assumptions and external data. So that provides a highly independent uh, uh, set of state variables that can be used for verific verification, validation, and data assimilation. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, long-term deployments, so we've demonstrated that we have a five-unit uh, network testbed that ha is enabling us to do future research and development. 
Uh, the water vapor and the calibrated aerosol products are very mature, uh, and we've really been working on the last uh, five years on improving the temperature dial. Those large errors that were anticipated uh, back in the 90s with Busenberg's work have largely been addressed. So oxygen dial certainly des deserves a, a new look uh, by the community. Um, our standard processing is a meeting that 3K uh, uncertainty requirement for improving numerical weather prediction. And uh, Matt's new advanced processing has improved that even further down to a two Kelvin, and we're now at the point where the instrument itself is limiting how far, uh, how, how much we can improve that. So we have some hardware uh, upgrades underway and some more testing to minimize that bias. And with that, I just will finish by saying this work was funded uh, by an MRI from NSF. Uh, we also had funding from NOAA uh, to work on the temperature as well as DOE ARM, and of course, lots of support from NSF NCAR throughout the years, and I just wanna thank you for your attention. Thank you for a seminar and being very much on time. We have plenty of time for questions. Plenty of time for questions. Hey. Uh, uh, <clears throat> very interesting, Scott. Uh, I have a couple questions. <clears throat> One is um, how much averaging, uh, what's the averaging time for what you think gives you a reasonably good estimate of the profile? Yeah, we're typically, uh, as we've created the combined instrument, the water vapor uh, temporal resolution is 10 minutes, and the temperature is 40 minutes. Okay. Uh, the second question is, what about that bias at low levels in the water vapor? Do you have any idea of where that comes from? Yes. Um, and that's kind of the, the maybe the difficulty of, of doing this, but also so there's some joy in getting to figure these out. Uh, we keep uh, wrestling back and forth over the years on what that might be. I think we maybe have a toehold on, on what that is, and we're working towards improving it. Uh, certainly rolling it out on all the instruments and being able to see differences, instrument uh, differences. The improvement in the uh, processing has really helped us nail that, uh, lace down what the issue uh, is it that it isn't uh, Having two different processing techniques, I think, helps us realize that the, it's not in the processing, that it really is in the instrument. Uh, we've looked at, uh, I don't want to speculate too much on it, but if you would like to come help us out, I'd love, love your help. <laughs> I can solve that in a hurry. <laughs> we have a question online from Jim Wilson, who says, I note the lowest height is about 300 meters. Is there any chance that can be lowered? Some. Yes, that's a good, uh, good question, Jim. And uh, so Robert is currently working on a, a new uh, technique. What limits us is the duration of the pulse. In order to get enough energy out of the semiconductor lasers, we're putting a pretty long pulse into space. It's a microsecond. And so we're blind for that time period. And then we need to do a, an absorption measurement. So you're looking at, we need to get to the first gate, and then we need to see the difference between that and the next gate. And so that's about 300 meters for this instrument. The way around that is to do short pulses. And so if you just did short pulses, well then you'd hurt your SNR. So uh, Robert's investigating a pulse compression technique where we would alternate short and long pulses. The short pulses would be average to be able to see down lower, and we would perhaps even go longer pulses to see further in, in range. And I know that technique is used in, in LIDAR, or sorry, in radar as well. Lines. Thank you. Uh, love your presentation. I, I missed the beginning, and uh, I wish I didn't because I love all your technology. It's fantastic. Um, but to follow up on that question, you know, certainly in our traditional radar systems, we can do pulse compression, so we can put out a long pulse, more power. I'm assuming in the LIDAR world, because we're just looking at the reflections, that's not a feasible way to, to answer some of these questions to increase range time. But does, in the LIDAR world, is there any concept of doing some type of pulse compression? Yeah, I think it's largely been ignored in the LiDAR world because uh, they are almost uniformly using uh, solid state lasers. M modifying those uh, creates some thermal problems. 
uh, certainly doing different, you know, different uh, pulse characteristics, you're probably going to create different lasing or sorry, lensing issues inside the resin there. You generally leave those steady state. Moving over to the semiconductor LiDAR architecture really opens us up to being able to do different modulations. Uh, these different, yeah, it really is in the architecture. I think this is just a brand new area for us to be able to explore. Um, and so it's exciting for us. Yeah, okay. I, I, I agree. I'm jealous. Yeah. Good for you guys. Uh, Follow-up question. M2 hats, if we look at that environment you operated in, which is pretty darn dry most of the time. Yep. We, we had the few so the hurricane, came hurricane that came through. How much did, uh, when I look at your height plots, how much variation of those heights is obviously dependent upon what's going on in the atmosphere? Uh, meaning... If we look at the M2 hat state, if we were maybe in a different location, would the heights been quite a bit higher? Where we're not in right. quite the dry end. Right. So, so for narrow band dial, if someone wants to ask about broadband dial that Vaisla does, I'm happy to talk about that. But for narrow band dial, uh, what we'll do is we actually try to keep the attenuation about the same, so you can tune along the line here. If you're operating at some place that's very dry, you would move the laser further up that line to have about the same amount of attenuation. And if you go someplace, when we were operating in Precip in Taiwan, we moved quite far down that line. And so you end up with the same attenuation on, in that uh, online. And so you can see to about the same amount. Uh, within reason, as you're looking up, you can imagine you have dry air. You've now just tuned your, your system to see the moist layer on the bottom, and then you have dry layer on top. It gets really difficult to do that. So it's easier to see further if you have very dry conditions. Uh, because, and it's really just being able to see the dry air up top. You're tuned a little bit better to those conditions. But you can at least see through the whole boundary layer by tuning the system this way. Question from Britt. Thanks, Scott. Uh, very nice presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, I'm just curious, what is the path between here and a network of several hundred sensors across the country? Is the technology ready or not? And then are, are you just writing papers demonstrating the technology and somebody else is going to pick that up and go with it? Or are you uh, hoping to be involved in sort of yeah. that effort? I think we'd like to be involved going forward. I think there's a couple things uh, that are going on. Uh, is one, we're trying to reach out to other groups to get them interested uh, so that they could come along and, and join and get other groups realizing, especially for the oxygen dial, that that was not a dead end and that can start to be uh, investigated again. Uh, we're also have been trying to work with a few different companies uh, to commercialize the system and that might be the path towards the large network is that somebody would need to, not us, uh, commercialize it, be able to figure out how to make these in volume. And so that's actively happening. We have, uh, we had a partner, of a Montana-based company, and now we have a Japanese-based company that we're working with to try to transfer our knowledge over. Uh, we'd like to start with the water vapor. That's simpler, but eventually teach temperature. And the other thing is we can start to partner, I think, with some universities. Uh, and if we can get them building them, uh, that's largely what's done in Europe with the Raman LiDAR network is they're very university-based, so it could be a teaching platform. And we could use that as well where we can reach out to, to the community through the universities and have them be part there. And so we can start to get at least the network showing up in places before the commercialization. So. Uh, done in parallel. Hey, Scott. Uh, you mentioned Vaisala's broadband dial system. Can you highlight sort of some of the differences between the MPD and this one? Thanks for queuing that up, Ben. Um, yes. Um, so I have a slide, and uh, this comes from Newsom uh, et al. in 2019, and they're evaluating the, the, the Vaisla dial. And it's a little unclear when you hear the word dial that there are two very different techniques. What I have been talking about is something that's very narrow band. And this is showing, again, a wavelength uh, on the bottom here and absorption. These are... Uh, water vapor lines, and if you can remember, uh, we just had a couple water vapor lines, so we're operating at about a tenth of one of these lines, 
uh, and then our receiver is maybe a third of one of the lines. So they're spanning multiple lines uh, with their online, and then they've moved over here for their offline. So why would they do that? Well, the laser is simpler to, to do in terms of locking it and controlling it, but in the process, what you're doing is you're having to open your bandwidth up considerably doing, by doing that, and so that's going to hurt your signal to noise when you go to a broadband dial technique. This also comes from the paper, and generally with this system, the 50% data availability range has been about 1.2 to 1.5 kilometers in range, and that's going to be fundamentally limited by this technique. There's really no way around it. You can turn the laser power up, but then you run into the eye safety classification, which they're not going to want to give up. So if you're going to do something that's a national network, uh, you're going to want to stick with the eye safety, uh, making sure the instrument's eye safe. So that's the difference between the two is really just the bandwidth. So, so, well, well, uh, is there a significant cost difference? Sorry, I heard So the question, just to kind of follow up with what you're saying, is there a significant cost difference from your perspective that I really don't know. I mean, I know what they're selling their instrument for, and can narrow band dial get down to similar costs? That'll be something that uh, the commercialization, the company's going to need to figure out. We have a much bigger receiver than they do, and that costs more money to make large optics. There's no point in doing that with device because you're just letting in more noise. Um, and so there could be some trade studies that are done in order to maybe, by making the telescope slightly smaller, but the the semiconductor LiDAR architecture is pretty low cost to begin with, so I think you're going to end up with something pretty similar price point, but I can't say for sure. Getting my exercise here. Would it be the same user base? Like if the errors of this technique are much higher, but they can tolerate it from a, a user-based perspective? Yeah, I, th I think the issue that I've seen from, uh, I think what, what I hear from uh, NOAA National Weather Service is they're ultimately going to want to buy the data, right? So it's need, it's, you're going to need to do some OSSEs to show uh, how impactful each one of these instruments are. I have seen uh, the broadband dial very typically not reach to the top of the boundary layer. So there's a lot of water vapor that's not being measured. My guess, I'm not an atmospheric scientist, is by not knowing that depth and not knowing all of that information to where you get to the dry layer is going to make a pretty big impact on weather forecasting. Um, there's another part in terms of cost. I should have said this, Terry, where you, you set me up for that is the broadband dial, if you notice, there's actually a little dashed line here. They've got a uh, line width for one receiver and then another line width for another receiver. The reason why that is is they don't know what their line width is. Um, and so they're sweeping that all into a calibration term that they're calling line width. And what they do is actually calibrate this against radiosons. So again, operationally, this instrument is going to have a higher operational cost because it is not self-calibrating. Um, and that's a bit, a little bit, uh, I think, obscured when you hear from the Weissler folks about whether this needs calibration or not. Uh, this paper clearly said that it did. Can I ask, um, is the MPD requestable for projects? What phase in the development is it in? Yes, it is. Uh, it tends to be requested at least uh, once a year, if not more. Uh, we hold one of the instruments back of the five units. Uh, and so we allow four to go out, and there are uh, there's a field project coming up for the Eclipse in New York, where three will go out for that, and uh, there's a request for Convect in now Arizona, uh, and then it's requesting all four, and we're starting to see that multiple units are being requested for the uh, upcoming field projects. Great. Well, we're looking forward to seeing MPD requested more often in the future, and. Looking forward to seeing more patents come your way. Um, if we don't have any further questions, um, before we thank our speaker one final time, I just want to make an announcement that we have refreshments on the east exit. Please avail yourself. Uh, let us thank Scott for um, his really interesting talk on MPD. Thank you.